Hi everyone and welcome to Biology Professor. Today I'm going to take you through the history of humoral miasma and germ theories. So basically these are three different theories, they're three different ways of understanding the spread of disease. Let's start with a uh, humoral theory. So it was dominant from ancient times to the 1800s, especially in the Western world. So when you think of like medieval times in Europe or uh, the early American colonies, humoral theory is really how people thought disease spread. They thought that disease was caused by imbalances in four different bodily liquids. These were blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. And each of these liquids was associated with uh, with different temperaments, with different seasons, but ultimately it was thought that to have good health, they had to be balanced in a particular way. And so there were treatments that were aimed at restoring the balance of these four humors. Treatments like uh, bloodletting with leeches, uh, the use of laxatives, um, also emetics to make someone vomit, blistering of the skin or the throat, things that we know today are usually not helpful in treating disease. And they were just trying to restore the balance here and unfortunately often did really more harm than good. Now, the next theory we're going to talk about today is miasma theory. It has also been dominant in various places from ancient times to about the 1880s. And so, even when the Western world began to give up humoral theory, they were then transitioning to believing more in miasma theory. Miasma theory held that disease was caused by something called miasma, which was basically bad air, sort of filthy, stinky, gross air given off by rotting organic matter. And you can kind of see how this made sense. If there's a lot of rotting dead bodies, dead mice in the road, um, a lot of sort of uh, human wastes and feces that make things smell really bad, a lot of unwashed bodies cramped together in cities that stink. Um, those are all situations where there's a lot of disease spread as well. Of course, we now know today that it's not just bad air. It's not just that smelly air makes everybody sick. But this is really <clears throat> uh, what people believed in sort of the mid 1800s and the late 1800s and it had its sort of upsides in that it led to improvements in sewage and general sanitation in major cities. Um, for example, one year, what's called the, the year of the great stink, London smelled so bad that Parliament couldn't even meet because the air just smells too foul. And so because they also thought that that horrible smell caused disease, that led to a lot of um, sort of sewage and sanitation improvements in cities, which um, <clears throat> was a really good thing. Now let's move on to talking about germ theory. So germ theory is basically the modern understanding of disease. It gained wide acceptance in the 1900s after miasma theory was debunked. Um, although, as we'll talk about in a minute, there was early evidence that predated the 1900s that was still in support of germ theory. Germ theory says that disease is caused by microorganisms or microbes. Hence the name germ. We talk about germs, we're talking about microbes. Now, there's a couple of caveats to keep in mind. One is that this is talking about infectious disease only. So diseases that are caused by, by bacteria, by fungi, by viruses. Um, we're not talking about diseases caused by more genetic and environmental components. 
So things like genetic disorders or cancers or, or diseases from um, exposure to pollutions or toxins, we're not talking about those types of disease. We're talking about infectious disease. And so infectious disease is caused by microorganisms. So this is the modern understanding of disease. It's not caused by imbalances of humors. It's not caused by smelly air. It's caused by microbes. Now this did have to be updated. Um, so in the 1930s, when viruses were first being understood, um, viruses are not technically organisms. They're not alive. They're not considered microorganisms. And so the germ theory had to be updated to be infectious disease caused by microorganisms and viruses. It had to be updated again when prions were discovered, prions being infectious proteins. Um, and now let's talk about some of the early evidence for germ theory. As early as the late 1600s, we had a scientist, Anton van Leeuwenhoek, who developed an early microscope, and he was the first person to actually see bacteria under a microscope. He called them animalculae or animalcules, which are based, is basically sort of the, the Latin for tiny animals. In the 1850s, we saw some public health uh, efforts from people who thought, you know, this miasma theory, it doesn't make sense to me. So people like Ignaz Semmelweis, who said, no, childbed fever that's killing all these women who have just given birth, it's not caused by bad air. I think it's caused by physicians not washing their hands. So he made people start washing their hands when they were delivering babies and um, sort of post-delivery infections went way down. Around the same time, John Snow was looking at the cholera outbreak in London and a London health official said, it's definitely bad air. And Jon Snow said, that doesn't make sense. I think it's dirty water. And he actually um, was able to trace it to the Broad Street pump and prove that cholera was a, a waterborne disease instead of an airborne one. In the late 1800s, Pasteur disproved spontaneous generation. This was the idea that uh, living things could come from non-living matter. He said, no, they can't. There's these microorganisms that we can't see. Uh, and then around the same time, Robert Cook was developing what are now known as Cook's postulates, which are the set of rules we have to go through and satisfy in order to say that, yes, this disease is caused by this organism. And so all of these um, uh, sort of advances towards germ theory really predated its, its final acceptance in the 1900s. So that's it today. If you're interested in these topics about epidemiology and disease spread, please see my playlist for those types of videos. You can learn more about Cook's postulates. You can learn um, more about various types of diseases and the way that they're transmitted, vectors, things like that. So check that out, and thanks for watching Biology Professor.